What's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. I'm Anik, I'm a classical pianist and today I would like to continue talking about the Chopin Etudes. Today with one of the most famous and most popular etudes which is Opus 10 number no. 1, the very first Chopin Etude. Many people are writing to me that they would like to play this etude but they think that their hand is too small to play it. So I thought it would be cool to talk a little bit about it because in my opinion the hand size does not play such a big role to play this etude. So in this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about Chopin's technique in general. Then I'll talk a little bit about the musical details. We are going to analyze a little bit what is happening there exactly. And out of this analysis, we'll come to the technique of this piece. As you might know, I'm studying all the Chopin etudes right now. And I would like to do at least one video for every single etude. If you don't want to miss any of these, make sure you subscribe to this channel. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And also, if you would like to see more of these videos in the future, please consider supporting me and this channel on Patreon. You'll find the link in the description box. Okay, let's start with Chopin's technique in general. What makes Chopin's technique so special? You know, in this time period when Chopin lived, there were a lot of upcoming piano schools. Everyone wanted to explain how to play piano. Everyone thought they know it better. <laughs> also, Robert Schumann tried something. He wanted to train his fingers, especially one finger. He felt like it is too weak and he wanted to strengthen it by forcing it to become stronger. He actually built a machine to like train it. However, he injured himself so badly that he couldn't play any piano afterwards anymore, or at least not on a high level anymore. Chopin was was like completely against all this stuff. He was more like this natural type who wanted to understand what is the nature of our body, our body as instrument, what is the nature of our fingers, what is the nature of the instrument, the piano, how are the keys working and how are these parameters like the instrument, so the piano and the human, how is this working together naturally. So instead of forcing his fingers to become stronger, he analyzed the nature of the fingers. So every finger is creating naturally a different sound, has naturally other abilities. And this is something you have to first understand. And this is also why fingerings are so important. So more important than the hand size or the actual length of the fingers is the fact that every finger has a different length and is on a different position on your hand and this is like creating different sounds. I also did a little video about this topic, you'll find it up here. So in the end, I would say as long as you can grab at least an octave, you should be good to go with like most of the piano literature. Maybe it's difficult to play some Brahms or Rachmaninoff, but most of the pieces you can play. Of course, at some point it can be easier to have bigger hands. However, just having bigger hands does not mean that every problem is solved. And actually also there are other problems for people who are having big hands, which people with small hands wouldn't understand. So instead of being jealous of what other hands look like, we should just accept what we have and learn to work with this. Because I'm sure for every hand size, for every hand shape, there is going to be a solution. To understand the technique of the Chopin Etudes, we have to stop thinking only with our fingers and start thinking more with our whole body. Especially we have to include our wrist and our elbow. Later we'll talk more about this. Now let's first concentrate on the music of this piece. The left hand is playing an extremely important role in Chopin's music in general. So let's first take a look at the left hand. Now you might think, uh, there is not happening so much in the left hand, it is just playing like octaves and nothing more. <laughs> the left hand is built up with a lot of long notes, which is also creating a melody here. Simultaneously, it is giving our right hand a lot of stability. So the more we can control our left hand here, the more stability it will give to the right hand. The left hand is playing in a deep bass region and only playing octaves, so it's automatically creating a big sound, a heavy sound. Now you might think it's not so difficult to play the left hand, especially if you compare it to the right hand. However, it is really not as easy as you might think, so we are going to talk about the technique here later. Let's continue with the right hand. The right hand is playing very big arpeggios, over five octaves, so it's going up and down. And in these arpeggios, there are four small arpeggios upwards and four small arpeggios downwards. And Chopin writes an accent there, at least in the very first bar, which normally indicates that he wants this for the rest of the piece too. And this accent is played by the fifth finger. What we also can see is that there is a rest 
in the right hand on the very first note than when the left hand is going to play. So the left hand is basically giving the impulse to the right hand to start. And therefore we need a very, very good connection between our hands. So I can feel when exactly I have to start with my right hand. I don't want to go too much into the musical part here because I think uh, I would like to do an extra video about this. We just clarified like what happens in this composition. Basically we analyzed it a little bit. So let's talk about the technique. As I said before, there has to be a connection, a very deep connection between left and right. Now, how do we get this connection? There are a lot of different parameters playing together and I won't talk about everything here, but let's start with the left hand again. As we said before, we have very long notes and these long notes, they have to be pulled through the whole length of the note. Very often people are just playing it and then they stop listening to it. Like you just play it and then you wait until, you know, the next one comes. <laughs> but there is no connection between these two octaves. To get this connection, we basically pull our arm through the whole length of the note. Now you might think, well, after playing the note, I can't really have an impact on the sound of this note anymore. This is of course correct, but all the movements that are happening afterwards, like after we hit a note, they are already starting to prepare the next note. like a little rule, I also talked about this in another video which you can find up here, is the 80-20 rule. So 80% after a note we are still listening to the note that we just played and 20% of the time after this note we need to prepare the next note. Sometimes it's like 80-20 or 70-30, this is like the ratio that we are playing with. So also in this case, if you just stop there and not listening to it anymore, it costs a lot of energy to get the connection to the next note. Now if you would just continue with this type of movement you're basically helping your brain to work and uh, like you know not to think anymore about it because it's going to come naturally. Like you're going to get into the next note in a very natural way. And also if you're not preparing the note very often you just hit it in a very vertical way which makes it very aggressive and very harsh which normally is not happening so much in Chopin's music. So I can't imagine that he wants this for like the whole piece here. I would really suggest to prepare it to create like the circular move so you get a vertical and a horizontal movement here, which will on the one hand create a warmer sound and also allow you to pull it through the whole length of the note. Now you see there's already much more behind the left hand than you know many people might think. And just by doing this, you're already starting to support your right hand. The technique of the right hand is basically created through turning points. We have a lot of turning points here happening and all these turning points are important. <laughs> so let's break it down. As we said before, we have like a big arpeggio, which is like going completely up over five octaves and then down. And inside this big arpeggio, there are little arpeggios. So let's start with the small arpeggio. In this small arpeggio, we have the turning point in our second finger. And the arpeggio is basically created through turning around the second finger. So here you can already see why the size of your hand is actually not as important anymore because you don't have to like grab the whole chord like from the beginning on and just play it with your fingers so you don't have to be already there with your fifth finger when you start playing the arpeggio this is something that you get automatically if you turn around with your second finger let me try to demonstrate it here let's take a deeper look if we would like to play like this only with the fingers it would be therefore we need really a big hand however if we are just taking the second finger as turning point so while playing this part here, everything is relaxed up here. And after playing the thumb, I would start to open up my hand to get the next part. So it's like... And the second finger is my turning point. So... So 
this is like the technique for the small arpeggios and this actually counts for like normally any type of arpeggio so uh when you're playing arpeggios in general there is somewhere a turning point very often on the second finger sometimes it's also another finger but this finger is like really essential for the arpeggio to work. So after we analyze the technique for a small arpeggio, let's continue with the connection between all these small arpeggios. So after playing an arpeggio, we need to prepare the next arpeggio. And between these arpeggios, there is a turning point which is created through our wrist. So we are coming up and then we are coming down again to, to start the next one. In this moment when we are up, we have time to relax a little bit our arm. The faster you play, the less you will see all these movements. Like, the faster you play, the smaller the movements are getting. And also, of course, it's getting harder to relax that much, so we have to find some other relaxation points. So in the end, we are like playing like this all the time, and therefore we need like this circular move of our wrist. <laughs> Here is the turning point of our wrist. So basically we start low and then we come up with our wrist to turn here. This is basically what happened. what's happening there. When we are playing fast, the movement is going to be smaller, but you can see that the wrist is still coming up a little bit, so. And then we have the big arpeggio, which is like starting from the bass, like directly after hitting the um, left hand going to the top there it is turning again and coming down it is turning again and going upwards so there are two turning points which is like the highest point this turning point is created through our elbow so we're coming up then we need to go out with our elbow so away from our body and then come back and this happens every time we play upwards and then we have the turning movement which is happening down here when the left hand is playing and the right hand has a rest. So really take the rest as a rest, get up your wrist a little bit to, you know, relax and then start a new movement. The first turning point is created through the second finger, the second turning point is created through the wrist and then we have the third turning point which is up there um, when we have to turn back which is created through our elbow. So it's basically like... Another technique that is trained here a lot is the opening and closing of your hand. To play the arpeggios, you of course have to open your hand. You, you need to get like very wide with your hand. But then as soon as you have to get to the next arpeggio, you have to get a much smaller hand. So the, the hand is closing and then you are opening up again and then closing again. So you are opening, closing, opening, closing, opening, closing all the time again and again. And this is also what I wanted to say, a big hand is not always helpful because this closing thing if you have a very big hand it's going to be very difficult actually so instead of being jealous really people with big hands have other problems okay <laughs> so let's sum it up we have all these turning points and we have this opening closing this is like the basic technique that we are working with and the rest as practice. <laughs> practice, 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 practice. You know, I started this attitude, I think, when I was maybe 14, 15, something like this. Now I'm 26, so, you know, there are 10 years at least of practicing. Of course, I was not only practicing this attitude, but I needed so long to get where I am now, and I still want to improve my technique. I still see so many things that I have to work on, so please don't be frustrated if it's not working after a month, because, you know, it's not going to be that easy.
So this was the video for today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like it, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell. Have you ever played this piece before? Tell me in the comments down below. I know that my interpretation of this etude is a little bit different from the mainstream interpretation, I would say. And this is exactly what I want to talk about in the next video, where I'm going to analyze a little bit more and more detailed what is happening in the music and show you more options for other interpretation. If you want to support me in this channel, check out the Patreon link in the description box. See you in the next videos. Bye. Unfortunately, I don't have my piano yet in my apartment, so I have to do it here at the Chopin University. And maybe you will hear some other people <laughs> practicing in the background. Uh, but I hope um, it's going to be fine. <laughs>